Okay, we are still talking about um, the general adaptation syndrome, which is the endocrine stress response. Um, what we talked about last time was um, the alarm phase, and the alarm phase is related to the sympathetic nervous system causing release of hormones from what organ? The adrenal medulla, epinephrine and norepinephrine primarily, okay? Um, now we are going to move into the resistance phase, and what's happening in the resistance phase is you're primarily going to be dealing with hormones that come from the adrenal cortex, okay? So... Um, what's happening during the resistance phase is um, the immediate stress. There is no tiger in the room, but you're co coping with long-term lower level stressors. Think chronic illness, think um, living in an abusive household, think starvation, think those kinds of things. So in the resistance phase, um, the immediate emergency is overcome. Longer term, lower level stressors. And what happens is you get involved with these guys, okay? So remember our two glucocorticoids, corticosterone and cortisol. And then remember, if you mess with corticosterone, it's going to cause um, aldosterone to get messed up. So keep that in mind for just a second. So let's go back to something that you knew before, which was that um, the way that you regulate cortisol secretion is okay the hypothalamus secretes crh and the anterior pituitary secretes acth and then it tells the adrenal cort, um, gland to secrete cortisol and then under normal circumstances that's going to feed back and say hey that's plenty of cortisol we're doing fine but there is another trigger for cortisol secretion and that is stress so stress puts in a neural signal that makes the hypothalamus secrete crh and then the adrenal um, cortex secrete acth and then you secrete cortisol, but the feedback mechanism doesn't work if you continue to put in the stress, okay? So this figure used to be in your textbook, but they took it out, but it's linked right here for you so that you can see it again. Okay, so now you're in a different phase, and this is the resistance phase. So what happens is due to chronic stress, you're going to kind of break your feedback mechanism because your circadian rhythms are going to make you try to stop secreting it, but then you continue to be stressed out and you're going to secrete it still. So due to chronic stress, the adrenal cortex may secrete not a ton more cortisol than normal, but really consistently more than normal. Like it's consistently a little high all the time. So the hypothalamus secretes CRH, the anterior pituitary secretes ACTH, and then the adrenal cortex secretes cortisol. And then, of course, um, not just cortisol. Remember, corticosterone will be involved to get all up in there as well. Um, be, and that will cause problems with aldosterone. So what is cortisol really doing for you? Cortisol is, and the, the glucocorticoids are really like friends when you are in need. So it's something that you would want to take advantage of, but you know it's going to cost you something. So they're totally cool when you really, really need them, but if they overstay their welcome, they're gonna eat up all your crap. Eat everything in your fridge, use everything you've got, okay? So it's a friend when you're in need, like during sleep or chronic illness or starvation, then you want to do these things, you totally do. But when cortisol overstays its welcome, it's going to use up all of your stores and start breaking down your muscle. So um, sleep, chronic illness, starvation, great overstay its welcome and you're under stress for long periods of time, then it's going to end up having some really deleterious effects. So let's look at the long-term effects of even slight over-secretion, chronic over-secretion of cortisol. So most of cortisol's effects are metabolic. It really wants to mobilize fuel into your bloodstream because you aren't eating or can't eat or you've got something that your body thinks would be, you would get through better if you had more nutrients in the bloodstream. So what it's doing is it is of course causing gluconeogenesis in the liver and if you didn't have proteins in your bloodstream it would start breaking down your own muscle so it'd start breaking down your own proteins definitely don't do any protein synthesis because like we do not trust that there's going to be a tomorrow so don't do any protein synthesis do some gluconeogenesis do some lipolysis right 
okay? And then um, most tissues that are not brain tissues can just suck it on the nutrients. They're like, no, you're really not getting any appreciable amounts. So these many tissues are like your non-essential tissues. So really what's going on is gluconeogenesis is going to start in the liver. It's gonna tear down your body proteins, especially bone and muscle, and it's going to convert them to amino acids to use for energy. So you're literally tearing your body apart and you're dropping your metabolism, importantly. And then it's going to decrease glucose up uptake and metabolism of non-essential tissues. Non-essential is growth and reproduction. So if you do not trust that there is going to be a tomorrow, there's really no reason to commit to protein synthesis and cell division and no um, reason to commit to reproduction. So typically speaking, stress reduces fertility, increases miscarriages, increases the likelihood of erectile dysfunction just because your body says, Shit's going down. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Let's make sure that we get all of the essential tissues taken care of before we take care of having an erection, for instance. Um, then there is a net reduction in metabolism as you're telling a lot of tissues to chill out. That means that if you also eat adequately, but you're stressed out, you're going to gain weight. Okay, especially in the abdomen where it's really bad for you. It does cause weight, lo weight loss in people when they're both stressed out and do not have plentiful nutri uh, nutrients, okay? Here in the United States, mm, even a lot of people who are living at poverty level have access to adequate numbers of calories, just not good calories. So typically speaking, stress and obesity do tend to go together in many places here in the United States. Okay. Then remember that you are constantly sort of dumping sugar into your bloodstream. You're doing um, uh, glycogenolysis in the liver, and when you run out, you'll do gluconeogenesis. And those chronically uh, high circulating glucose levels, especially if you're also eating sugary foods, um, are going to increase your risk of type 2 diabetes. There are some other impacts of chronic cortisol secretion that are kind of interesting. Um, you would think that your immune system was considered an essential tissue, but immunity is actually preparing for the future. It's not defense, like fighting things off today. So it inhibits your immune system. So cortisol, remember I got, told you guys, it could be used uh, clinically to reduce inflammation, but use it or take it or secrete it uh, chronically and what it's going to do is it's going to kind of put its foot on your immune system. It's going to reduce antibody secretion, it's going to reduce T-cell proliferation. This will lower your resistance to disease, it will lower your resistance to cancer, and it will slow whatever healing processes need to be going on. That's with chronic secretion. Okay, then interestingly, I know you've heard many times before that ulcers increase with stress. We didn't know why for very long. Now we think we might know why. Well, a couple things happen with stress. First of all, with stress, we reduce blood flow to the digestive tract, um, but we also are putting our foot on our immune system. Uh, most of us have Heliobacter pylori in our gut, but it doesn't do much damage, but then put your foot on your immune system and there's the opportunity for a bloom of Heliobacter pylori. And that actually will um, eat a little hole in the side of your digestive tract and cause uh, stomach and intestinal ulcers. And then way back when I told you that it would come back to know that um, cortisol and also epi um, help with constriction of vessels. And that's all well and good when you need constriction of vessels. But if you're always secreting just a little bit more than you should, then your vessels are a little bit more constricted than they should be, which of course adds to blood pressure. Um, so um, the other thing is that if you're always secreting cortisol, um, you might not have it when you need it. If you go into, for instance, shock and your vessels go, hey, dilate, then they immediately should constrict, but they will only do that if you have adequate levels of cortisol. So keep that in mind for just a second. <clears throat> okay. Now, interestingly, and this is really, really current research, like within the last five years, some of this has been published. Um, there are parts of your brain um, that your body says are worth spending nutrients on more than others during chronic stress situations. 
Um, and so what happens with the brain is that chronic stress tends to tell the vigilance portions of your, gra of your brain, like the amygdala, which is like your fear center, that, hey, you really need a lot of nutrients. We really want to send more blood flow and everything to you. And so typically what happens is the amygdala gets a little bigger. It's probably happening in a lot of us in 2020. The amygdala gets a little bigger and a little more active if you use an fMRI. And then the portions of your brain that are related to future activities, like the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus for memory formation, those tend to decrease, get decreased blood flow and decreased nutrient flow. So what happens is you're more afraid and you're less able to make good long-term decisions in which you're like, I know I want this thing right now, but I think it would be better if I actually did not get this thing and made a plan for the future. So the things that tend to increase with stress are anxiety and sleep disturbances. And I'm not, I'm sure I'm not the only person who's experienced that. And then the te things that tend to decrease with stress are self-discipline, planning, and decision-making. Super duper in interesting stuff. And then of course, remember that whenever you mess with your glucocorticoids, they will mess with your aldosterone. And then aldosterone causes sodium retention at the expense of potassium secretion, remember, at the kidney. And so what you're going to do is retain an excess of sodium and water in the body and excrete an excess of potassium into the urine. And so what happens is the combination of vessel constriction and sodium retention means that your blood pressure is probably going to be higher. In addition, of course, epi is increasing your heart rate as well. Okay, so I think this is supposed to go here. Um, now, so what's the net hormonal result of chronic stress? What does it do? Well, basically, it's not going to be surprising to any of you. You have an anxious, sleepless person amygdala, high blood pressure, vessels, water retention, sodium retention, relatively few energy reserves because cortisol is telling you, you to use them and epi is telling you to use them, higher probability of cancer, higher probability of ulcers, catches every damn opportunistic pathogen that comes around, higher risk of myocardial infarction because you are dumping potassium and causing hypokalemia, higher risk of type 2 diabetes, decreased mental coping skills, decreased decision-making skills. So something we're thinking about is how this would affect a child in his or her growing years. So a child in your household, a child in someone else's household, a child who is growing up in an abusive situation, a child who is growing up in a war-torn situation, a child who is growing up incarcerated on the border. How does this actually impact this child in his or her growing years? Well, you would imagine that this child would have um, more missed school, for instance, because their immune system was reduced. Probably less growth, less healing than you would have, slower healing than you would otherwise have. How about behavior aspects? If I compare my relatively privileged 14-year-old child versus a 14-year-old child in Syria right now, is there any difference, assuming the two children had absolutely the same capacity, intelligence, and access to education, right? Can you expect any difference outcomes in their education? Could you, for instance, expect that my child would have a bit, a bit more control over his behavior in social and school situations than the other child because of physiology, not just because of personality. So this is really important and it's an important crossover between sort of um, public health um, and human behavior and um, what you guys are probably going to be going into in something clinical. Okay, so um, the next stage, next th stage we will talk about is what happens at the end. What happens at the end is either it worked and you got through whatever was causing the chronic stress or your chronic stress continues and then you can sometimes succumb to all of the damage that occurred because of the hormonal coping mechanism for the chronic stress. So the next stage, two possibilities. The stage of recovery, this would be ideal. It was expensive to get through that, but it was worth it because the system's mechanisms successfully overcame the stressor effect. Or 
you completely eliminated the stressor. Like everything was terrible. You did not have enough money for your rent. And then your fortunes changed, your behaviors changed, and life is fine again. Um, and if that occurred, then the high glucose, the high fat, the high amino acid levels in the blood were useful to maintain the anabolic reactions that were necessary. And then you get a restoration of homeostasis and eventually you get a regeneration of cells and eventually you'll have actually even replace your stores. But um, what also could happen is you could hit the stage of exhaustion. So if the stressor was not overcome or the body's negative feedback controls are just completely inadequate and you're constantly dumping cortisol and aldosterone, then um, a lot of there's a lot of possibilities for damage and for death. Death can occur due to an opportunistic infection. So non-stressed out person gets exposed to bird flu, doesn't get it, doesn't die. Um, stressed out person gets exposed to bird flu, gets it, has terrible outcomes. Complications from diabetes, which we know are pretty severe. Cancer, increased likelihood in a stressed out person. Shock. So if a person who is not stressed out gets in a car accident, this is what happens. Vasodilation, blood pressure really drops, but immediately vasoconstriction, right? But um, that's what should occur. Um, and a person who's really stressed out and has been chronically over secreting cortisol um, gets into a car accident, vasodilation, and then I try to secrete cortisol to support the vasoconstriction, but I just can't. I'm just petered out on the cortisol secretion. And so that person goes into circulatory system shock and is more likely to die of it, which is when your blood pressure drops way below um, what's necessary to pump blood adequately. Um, and remember, hypokalemia can cause cardiac arrhythmias, which increase the risk of my myocardial infarctions. So all bad news until you realize that um, there are things that can help. And also, one physiology class is probably not going to do this to you, but I am sorry if you're stressed out right now. Um, okay, so what can help? Um, reduce cortisol levels, right? Stop being so stressed out. That's super helpful. Uh, reduce your stress, yeah? Good diet, exercise, sleep, sex with a willing partner. Um, other mechanisms of reducing cortisol, um, prepared. The more prepared you are for the situation you're going to go into, the less of a stress response you will have. Reduce perception of stress. Again, sometimes that's cognitive behavioral therapy. That can help some people. It doesn't help everyone. Um, gaining control over your environment. So when I am feeling stressed out, sometimes you need to actually ex exert control, not over the people in your environment, because that'll cause them to secrete cortisol. But have you ever run into the situation in which you like do not feel like you can do a damn thing unless your desk is cleaned off? or unless the house is clean, or unless something else is taken care of. So interestingly, this actually does work, and they have actually done experiments. Um, friendship and support. So if I'm doing something difficult and I have support in other humans, you actually secrete less cortisol. Um, the other thing is our magical little friend oxytocin. Over the last few years, they've figured out that oxytocin can actually help quite a bit to counteract some of the negative impacts of stress. So why? First off, oxytocin causes vasodilation, which lowers your blood pressure. It also has the ability to repair damaged cardiac muscle, which is just bizarre as hell. We haven't found much that could possibly do that. It also decreases the inflammatory response, which can be problematic. It also increases trust between people, which helps you to um, uh, decrease cortisol secretion. Um, so how do you get more oxytocin? Welcome physical contact. If it's unwelcome, it's going to really make you release cortisol. Welcome physical contact between, between two people. You don't even have to touch the person, but if you're playing with your kids, if you're with somebody you're fond of, you generally release some cortisol. Play with your kids, play with your pets. Sex again with a willing partner, right? Preferably enthusiastic will cause oxytocin release and also decrease the damaging effects of cortisol. And then friendship and human connections can also help as well. Last thing, there are some fantastic things in the rabbit hole right here. Um, if you are interested in reading any of them, and I may ask one of them, um, probably will ask the diabetes one that I told you guys about in a test question, which will be later. Done with endocrine.